HCAs! What on earth are they and what have I got to do with them? Let's find out in this series of videos. Hi everyone, welcome to another video in the Sensible Senko series and this time we're going to be looking at the Education Health Care Needs Assessment. This is actually a video that's been over on my other channel, which I don't use anymore, um, for quite a while and it's been a really popular video with parents but it was actually designed as a PowerPoint that they could just flick their way through and support them in applying for that Education Health Care Needs Assessment. What we've decided to do is actually update it a little bit and present it for Senkos as well. If you like it, don't forget, give it a thumbs up, click that subscribe button and leave me a comment in the comment section below. Okay, so I'm going to start by picking up my trusty SCND code of practice. This is my bound version, available on Amazon, simply because I can't stun the one that falls to pieces. And we're looking at chapter 9, and there are 217 bullet points in chapter 9. It's probably the biggest chapter in the SCND code of practice. And it talks about education, healthcare, assessments and plans. Probably gives us an indicator how important it is. But there are two bullet points I want to read. First one is 9.1. The majority of children and young people with SEN or disabilities will have their needs met within local mainstream earlier settings, schools or colleges. Some children and young people may require an education health care needs assessment in order for the local authority to decide whether it is necessary to make provision in accordance with an EHC plan. Bullet point 9.2 talks about the purpose of the EHC plan, but bullet point 9.3 is the other one I want to read. It says, a local authority must, and that is in great big old writing must conduct an assessment of education, health and care needs when it considers that it may be necessary for special education provision to be made for the child or young person in accordance with an EHC plan. That's actually really important because sometimes the local authority puts parameters on us that are not really there. The legal basis is if the child has needs then they need an assessment. Okay, so let's have a look at that PowerPoint that I was talking about. Bearing in mind this was written for parents, but the first thing is to think about why the child actually needs a statutory assessment. And it's strange, we still actually use the phrase a statutory assessment, even though statements have actually gone, because that is what an EHC is. Now, it might be obvious to the parent and it might be obvious to you, but actually the people who make the decisions, that panel, well, that child is just whatever is written on a piece of paper. So actually we really need to make sure what we're putting in those assessment applications makes them go, whoa, yeah, we need a plan for this child. This PowerPoint takes us through the different things that we could think about when planning for an assessment. Okay, so the first slide is about abbreviations and let's face it, as Senkos, we have a degree in being able to interpret these things, but for parents they very often don't know what they stand for. As a Senko working with a parent, it's our job to make them feel comfortable and sometimes you're going to have to explain these numerous times so that they understand. The first thing we need to do with parents is actually explain to them what an EHC assessment is. The EHC assessment establishes whether additional support is needed to meet the needs of that child or young person. That doesn't mean they necessarily need the full plan. Most needs can actually be met without a plan. Many more can be met without the need for an assessment. So if we already know a child has literacy difficulties, it doesn't mean we necessarily need a full assessment for them. 
but sometimes we do. Sometimes we don't have the full picture of that child and it's really important to try and get that. We have three levels. So the needs of the child or young person are met within school. The school and the parents are working together and any professionals too. The school is using its resources to make reasonable adjustments and appropriate assessments and deliver those programmes that suit the child's needs. Or we might be at the second stage where the needs of the child are not being met or they're not understood or we need further information. This is where we might consider putting in an EHC assessment application. Whether we get a plan out of it, we're not actually sure at that point in time, but we know that we need more information about the child and the assessment could give us that information. The third one is that we desperately need specialist educational provision, whether that's within the mainstream or within a special school. And at that point, we definitely need an EHC plan. So we're going to have to put in the assessment request to get that. One of the things I really want to pick up on here is that schools talk about applying for an EHCP. The school does not ever apply for an EHCP, neither does the parent. You're applying for the Education Healthcare Needs Assessment, the result of which might be a plan. Why might we be looking at it then? Well, this slide is entitled My Child, because like I say, it was written for parents. And it talks about speaking with the school first. We would hope that the school is speaking with the parent as well. We know it doesn't always happen. And sometimes what's going on at home and what the parent sees isn't always what we see in school. We have to be prepared to listen to both sides. Anyway, there might be some difficulties with cognitive skills or social skills or personal skills, all of which are factors which feed into an education health care needs assessment. But they also actually feed into our job as a SENCO to have that big picture of the child and know lots and lots about them. If a child's falling behind in literacy or numeracy, we might be looking at a specific learning difficulty. If they're unable to cope with change in the classroom, we could be looking at a communication and interaction disorder. Or One of the interesting things is that parents very often don't understand that to go up to that next level of applying for the EHC assessment, the child actually needs to be on the SENCO's radar first. It's amazing how many parents will put in that application without realising their child's needs are met through reasonable adjustment and they're not even on the register at SEN support. So the SEN Decode of Practice says that we must deliver high quality teaching designed to meet the needs of the children and young people in our classes. Sometimes though, children and young people need a little bit more than this. Parents might misinterpret that. So if a child's been made part of a literacy booster group for year six SATs, they might interpret that as, my child's behind, my child isn't doing well enough, my child needs an EHCP. Or maybe we've got a summer-born baby. You know, we know that they tend to be a little bit behind their peers. They do eventually catch up. But it doesn't mean their special educational needs. And, of course, there's a normal range of ability. So if we take a class of 10-year-olds, actually it's perfectly normal to have a couple of them in there with a reading age of 8 and a couple in there with a reading age of 12. But again, parents don't always understand that. They will just say, my child is 10, they've got a reading age of 8. Ah, panic! It doesn't necessarily mean that they have a special educational need, they're just at the lower end of that normal range. If as a school you don't have that child on your SEN register, then parents are not going to be successful applying for an EHC. It's really worth building that relationship with them and when the parent pops up on your doorstep and says, I want an EHCP for my child, you're going to have to have that conversation and say, well, actually, their needs are met within school. We don't need it because, and give them those reasons. 
So this slide was just a little bit of an illustration for parents again. So English as an additional language is not a special educational need. Being slightly behind their peers but within the normal range is not a special educational need. Having a short-term need, for example breaking their arm or needing a bit of catch-up, guess what? It's not a special educational need. I could go through all the rest of those on the screen, but I think you probably get the gist. They are not special educational needs. But parents might not always understand that. To them, it is special and it is affecting their child's education and therefore it must be a special educational need. Making our role and defining special educational needs for them is really important. And this comes from your SEND information report, which should be on your school website, and your SEN policy and graduated approach. So this is the activity I usually recommend parents start with. They need to get a really large sheet of paper and some pens. They need to draw their child, stick a picture of them in the middle of it. It really doesn't matter. The idea is they just need something to remind them what they're actually doing. And around the edge, they need to write all the positive qualities about their child. What's great about them? What's fantastic? What's brilliant? What do they love about their child? The reason they're doing this is because it sounds really awful. Parents tend to get, end up with quite a negative view sometimes of what's going on. And this will serve to remind them of all those positive qualities that their child possesses. The second activity for them is to repeat that, but this time to write down the things that worry them. What are the child's needs? Is it that they've been late to learn toileting? Or is their speech unclear? Is it that they're struggling to learn to read or to keep friendships in school? What is it that the parents are worried about? But that was for parents. There's nothing stopping a school doing the same thing. To sit down with that piece of paper and put down all those things they like and admire about the child. Those strengths that sometimes parents don't see, you know, the fact that they can be a great friend to somebody in school or that they're always the one happy to hand out the worksheets at the start of the lesson. Or when we're looking at those barriers, what are they? Is it that the child doesn't have the skills to decode something, but actually with a bit of input they could do? Breaking it down, really getting into what those needs are. I also tell parents to try and get the bigger picture. Well, if the parents are doing this and you as a school and the SENCO are doing this, then we've already got a fair few parts of it already. However, wider family can be really, really helpful and friends and next door neighbours. Getting them to do it with those, they, they sometimes see things that parents don't see too, especially the strengths. And getting professionals. So if we've got professionals involved with that child, getting them to contribute to what the barriers are and what those strengths are for that individual. So once we've gathered that information, those two posters are strengths and our barriers, we can then make a decision. Does this child need an assessment for their educational needs, their special educational needs? We might not fully understand what that child is capable of, in which case, yeah, we might need the assessment. Maybe the school doesn't have enough information in order to plan the next step forward. Maybe this is a, a need you've not come across before, in which case they need an assessment. Maybe that child or young person needs more support than the school can currently provide. They need an assessment. And maybe we know that that child has a degenerating disorder and we need to look at what their future options are going to be, in which case we need an assessment. However, for everybody involved, it's really, really, really important to remember that not every education healthcare needs assessment is going to lead to a plan. It might be that the information we gather from it is enough to move forward. We don't necessarily need it written out in statutory form in the form of an EHCP. 
So we've now made our decision. We want to move forward. We want to apply for an education healthcare needs assessment. There's a second video in this series which talks about gathering the information together and writing the letter to the local authority. Now you might find your local authority dictates to you how you present that information. I can tell you that that's not a legal request. If you want to submit it on the back of a post-it note, you can do. There's a couple of sentences that you must include, but they cannot force you to fill things in. However, like most local authorities, we have to jump through a few hoops and sometimes making our lives easy in that respect can be really, really helpful. I hope to see you in the second video where you'll see what we do next. Thanks for watching everyone.